Thank you very, very much for the invitation. And I want to acknowledge, as Melinda has done, the traditional owners of the land where I'm sitting, who are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Well, thank you so much, Dana, for your wonderful introduction, because that's just a perfect uh, background for me. I'm going to try and, well, this is really, um, Dana has given us that in, a valuable background to 1325 and what it does, but let me just say that What's very striking this year, um, since 3025, there have been, uh, depending on how you count, eight or nine further resolutions that form the women, peace and security agenda. But I was very struck by the fact we all expected the one to be adopted for the 20th anniversary just uh, two weeks ago. And very strikingly, and I believe for the first time, the resolution failed to be adopted. It was a resolution Russia uh, was the pe so-called pen holder in the Security Council. And it negotiated a, uh, or failed to negotiate, depending on your perspective, a resolution that was acceptable. So the unusual situation came about that there were five positive votes in the Security Council for the resolution, but there were 10 abstentions. Uh, and so this meant that the resolution wasn't adopted. And uh, so I, I note that despite the value of 1325, the women, peace and security agenda is in some sort of trouble if there couldn't be a resolution uh, adopted this year. And partly the reasons for that are very interesting and perhaps we can go into those in question time, but uh, it was seen to be a very problematic resolution from the perspective of 10 members of the Security Council. Uh, now, Dan has already pointed out, so he, here is the Security Council this year um, at the time of the debate. So Dana has already very helpfully set out the main themes in the so-called Women, Peace and Security agenda that's been inaugurated by Resolution 1325. And I, I, I won't go through those again. I just want to note a few features of 1325. First of all, um, if there are references to gender, there are no references to men. Well, there's one reference to men um, uh, and that's in the context of demobilization. But uh, it's, it's, it's one of, I think, the problems with the resolution is that it completely assumes that women and gender are identical. So that's, that's, that's one of the, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. But um, one can analyze some of the difficulties within the resolution, but we have to acknowledge, and I think the work of Itak Maki is a perfect example of this. I've been looking at the wonderful website and a lot of the videos and talks on the website to see, um, and Itak Maki is not alone, that civil society has actually, I think the greatest advances have come from the picking up of this resolution by civil society um, to formulate demands for political and disarmament processes. But at the institutional level, we get every year, the Secretary General of the UN since 2010 has published a report every year on how is the women, peace and security agenda going. And it's just striking reading those reports every year, how much the, um, the Secretary Generals tend to be quite frank and just use phrases such as persistent implementation deficits all the way through. So there's a general acceptance that we've got this resolution, but countries have been very, very slow to take it seriously and to implement it. And Dan has already pointed out some of the issues in terms of actual representation of women. But uh, the argument I just want to make very briefly, tonight, the argument I want to introduce is that I think one of the problems that's slowing down the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security project itself is that it's built on contradictory and impoverished images of women and of men and the fact they're very rarely there. So on one hand, it depicts women as agents of political change through whose task is to prevent and resolve conflicts. Um, and there is a certain typecasting of women as peacemakers. So in a way, it seems very instrumental. We need more women involved in peace processes somehow because women are just more peaceable than men, which is, which is a problematic assumption. On the other hand, the resolutions present women and girls and children as a group with special needs 
requiring protection by a strong and read for that male authority to determine the proper measures for their security. So, as I've mentioned, the elision in the resolutions of the terms women and girls on the one hand and gender on the other, I, I think is very significant. There's no suggestion that those terms might mean something different or that gender might encompass expectations of masculinity as well as of femininity. So let me then turn to what I'll call the visual economy of the women, peace and security agenda. I think uh, it's important whenever we look at images that represent this agenda, and you can see I've got even on this slide, I don't know if you can see there's an image of a woman wrapped into 1325 there. Yeah, and uh, if you, I, I won't dwell on this one because I want to spend um, the short time I have on another image, but I think it's quite a problematic image of women. If you look at it, it's clearly a Western woman. Um, I actually think it looks like a woman in a hair shampoo advertisement. And if this is the promise of women, peace and security, um, it's extraordinarily limited. But I think we need always when we're looking at images and if nothing else comes through from my talk this evening, this is the point I'd really like to make. We should always observe what is highlighted, what is hidden within the frame, what perspectives are represented and what views are obscured. And I think if we pay attention to the visual, we can see an ambivalence in the images here about women's roles in conflict. Now, usually um, uh, scholars of visual culture point out that as soon as you have women and children, they're the quintessential victims in all humanitarian imagery. They signal passivity, innocence and nonviolence. And if you had depictions of groups of men, they're, they're very rarely read in that way. But I want the, the image I just want to dwell on is this image, which is on the cover of Australia's National Action Plan. Now, before I've, I was very struck by the story about Israel's National Action Plan. And before you think, isn't Australia terrific? We have a National Action Plan. Let me tell you this, it, you can see the end date here, 2018. Um, the government has promised us that they would do an up-to-date plan. Nothing has been seen since 2018. The government formally extended it to last year, but then it's gone completely off their agenda. But I, I so that's, a, that's an issue in itself. But let me just look at that particular image that was used by the government to illustrate its national action plan. So this is a photograph of Australian soldiers in Afghanistan taken by an official army photographer. So I assume that the point of these images is designed to reassure the reader and civil society that Australia is delivering on its commitments under Resolution 1325. So we can see here two figures in camouflage uniforms speaking to an Afghan woman dressed in a full black burqa. She has a young girl, possibly a daughter at her side, wearing a vivid green headscarf over a colorful salwa kameez. I don't, can't quite work out what the child um, the girl child is carrying, sorry, it's, it's a fairly blurry photo. That's just a, um, when I've expanded it. Uh, so one soldier has a machine gun slung over her shoulder in profile and the face looks to be friendly, underlining, I take it, the benign nature of the encounter. And we can't see a lot of the other uniformed person, but they appear to be wearing a headscarf under their helmet. Now, it's striking to me that the Afghan women and the girls are only viewed from the back. There is, I think, a young boy there too. The sex of the soldiers isn't clear from the image, but if you see the photo credit, it tells us that this is Corporal Jenny Sapwell of Mentoring Task Force 2 and an interpreter chatting with local Afghan women, women in Aruzgan province in southern Afghanistan. So I take this image to be trying to emphasize Australia's progressive attitude to the inclusion of women in its armed forces on the same terms as men. So here's a woman soldier serving in Afghanistan, smiling at the locals and yet carrying a powerful weapon, but she's part of what's called a female engagement team. So she, that main soldier that we can see in profile stands in contrast to the faceless Afghan figures whose clothing marks them as pre-modern and engulfed in custom. So this is far from a chat, an encounter between equals. It seems rather a meeting of two different worlds, one of women 
the Australian soldier who've achieved equality with men, and the other of a traditional society where women are veiled and oppressed. So the intention of the image might be to show that the military missions, such as the Australian forces in Afghanistan, can deliver peace and security for women. But it certainly implies that this is going to be a top-down exercise. It's us advanced people coming to bring enlightenment to you over there. Corporal Sapple's military weapon underscores the inequality of the engagement. So she offers a type of friendship that's backed up by military superiority. I think the children are there uh, to signal the Afghan women's peaceable natures. The other image from an Australian perspective is that it anchors the women peace and security agenda firmly in foreign lands where, and I'm quoting here from Australia's National Action Plan, women and girls face devastating human rights violations, including high levels of sexual and gender-based violence. That's why we Australians are there. But of course, that description can readily apply to Australian society and the idea that we have to go abroad to find these serious cases of human rights violations against women. So the women, peace and security agenda for Australians is something that we pursue resolutely offshore. And uh, we can see here, uh, it allows enlightened military women from the global north who can travel abroad and deploy force along with their male colleagues. Uh, and yet they still have a special value through their entree with local women. So we're told that the female engagement teams we see depicted here, um, and this is a quote from the plan, are able to bridge the cultural gap where most Afghan women are not able to be engaged by the predominantly male security forces. So this view of women soldiers as less confrontational than men and less able to get broader access to security issues across traditional societies is very broadly held within the UN. But we can see, I think, that the engagement as such is very limited. The Australian woman soldier seems inaccessible in her high-tech military cocoon, uh, while the Australian's Afghan interlocutors appear as silent, shadowy figures trapped in tradition. So I think the overall message I take from this is that women from the global south are the main victims of conflict and are the primary beneficiaries of the women, peace and security agenda. They are the quintessential spectacle of victimhood. Women from the global north appear only in the guise of security providers. Now, I, I, I will end now, but I just, I have an, another image that if there's time, we might come back to discuss another image, I think a very problematic image, but one used everywhere of women, peace and security. Um, but let, let me just reflect on what work these visual images are doing. So the visual plays a very important role in the international circulation of ideas. Images of conflict follow a set of conventions regulating what can be shown and what can't appear. For example, it's acceptable to show images of the injured or dead if they're from the global south. The picture of the three-year-old Syrian boy, Alan Kurdi, his body washed up on a Turkish beach in 2015, made headlines in media around the world but it's not possible if victims are from the global north. For example, no images of dead or wounded people were televised after the attacks on the United States on the 11th of September 2001, or after the later attacks on London and Paris. Visuality is critical to the women, peace and security agenda. And I think women, peace and security imagery has its own set of visual conventions. So uh, in my argument, uh, the visual imagery reproduces the limitations of the agenda. I'll perhaps just stop sharing my screen there. Um, and uh, it reproduces uh, existing asymmetries of power. In this way, I think the women, peace and security agenda, the visual imagery provides a narrative for international intervention. Uh, The UN's very slow progress then in achieving the women, peace and security agenda goals, to me, suggests that its members, the UN's members, have become practised at women, peace and security rhetoric, but are unwilling to go further than this. So I want to end with a question, and I thought this uh, would uh, 
provide a nice segue to Gull's images, which I've had the good fortune to have a preview of. Um, the question is then, I've told you a rather critical story about the visuality of the Women, Peace and Security agenda, but it leads to the question, well, can visuality, besides offering these limited images, can it also offer techniques to deepen the emancipatory potential of the Women, Peace and Security agenda by destabilizing its standard categories? And Gal has got a wonderful set of images to, I think, give us all hope. Thank you.